Gentlemen, the gentleman from Ohio, Dr. Winstrup, is recognized to inquire. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ms. Ojewumi, I thank you for being here today and appreciate your courage and strength through your uh, battles and your fight for your life. I'd also like to point out, too, the goodness of humankind, and that comes from your donors. Uh, let's not forget the part that they played, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing that you are able to be here with us today. I also want to talk about you know, the, the potential benefits of innovation as far as long-term costs. We look at a drug as being expensive, and we also need to always look at, at what we save in the long run. I look at the, the cure for hepatitis C, what we save in palliative care. I look at biologics for rheumatoid arthritis, which may be expensive, uh, but at the same time, rheumatoid arthritis you know, there's 360 joints in the body, and it can hit every one of them. As a surgeon, as a foot surgeon, I did massive undertakings of reconstruction of feet because of the damage done from rheumatoid arthritis, and I used to lecture on it, and that went away. That's gone. And not only is the surgery gone, but so are many injections people had to get, and oral medications, and the formation of things like rheumatoid nodules. I quit seeing it. I mean, on one patient one time, I removed 16 nodules. And the deformities that come that often lead to ulcers and infections, all that's gone. So we should always also, in, when we're taking a look at things, look on the other end of what we are actually saving in the long run. And I think we do that. But I do want to talk about Part B. Ms. Delbeni was, uh, brought up some good points. And, and Dr. Miller, I want, to, I want to address you. You know, the average sales price plus 6%. Uh, you know, I'd like to believe that doctors going to recommend what's best for the patient at all times. But I think what we're hearing is that that creates an incentive for the provider then to use the most expensive medication amongst their choices because they'll get reimbursed more. So it's kind of a perverse incentive there. And for the pharmaceutical company, I believe what's being said is they sometimes feel empowered to raise their price because it will make it the drug of choice if it's more expensive because of the reimbursement. And that, therefore, as a result, the patient pays more as well. Is, is that what we're talking about in this scenario? Yeah, that's precisely what we're talking about. And I also don't think the, the physician's decision has to be, you know, not in the interest of the patient. You could have two drugs that are relatively effective and one, you know, equally effective and one is more expensive. You go with the expensive one. But that's what I want to get to is oh, maybe that's to, the go, issue. to go towards the less expensive one if, if all things are being equal here. Well, how do we get to that? So, you know, I want your thoughts on my suggestion that the provider gets paid the cost of the medication that they paid for and a flat fee as you've recommended. Then there's really no incentive. They're going to get paid back with the drug costs. They get a flat fee. Now, what I think that might drive is a, and should drive is a conversation with the patient where I often did this with patients. I'll give a good example of treating neuropathy. There's a medication, gabapentin. It's very inexpensive. And it works for a lot of people. If it didn't work, then I might go to an alternative like Lyrica or something like that and see that's more expensive. And I have that conversation with my patients. And I think that should be the same with all these Part B drugs as well, where you are in a situation where you sit with the patient and say, you know what, I've got these four options. Transparently, I can tell you what it's going to cost you out of pocket or give you some idea. And I think that either one can be substituted. So what do you want to do? And you make that decision with your patient. I, I mean, I, I think I agree with you. It's in a flat fee environment, you've removed the incentive for the provider to go for the more expensive one. Do we really have to mandate the conversation to take place between the, the doctor and the patient? Or do you think that would happen naturally? Because to me, it happened naturally. I, I mean, my, my inclination is, is that it happens naturally, that you don't need to mandate it. But I think the most important thing is to remove the financial incentive. So anybody who wants to weigh in, what do you think of that idea of, of reimbursing the provider, the cost of the medication, uh, plus a flat fee? Uh, yeah, certainly it's, I, I, I clearly support that idea. On the, on the, I, I wanted to address the question of the conversation between the doctor and the patient. Um, you may be the exceptional physician. Uh, I, 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 there's, there's pressure, as you know, to run your practice. Uh, but patients often need help. I think this is especially the case we see with people with diabetes. One of the reasons that they, they aren't willing to change is that they're used to precisely 
the packaging, the way it's injected, and so on. Uh, and they need help. They need help by someone that they trust, who has a medical background, doesn't have to be a physician, who can guide them through that choice. And that may take more time, and they may take a little more hand-holding than, than uh, a physician would have. Well, there's certainly a lot of things the government has done that have taken away the time for the hand-holding, and that's why you see so many doctors running for Congress, but that's another story for another day, and I yield back.